Hello and welcome back. If this is your first time joining us, this is a part three of a three-part series, so you may want to go back and watch part one and part two. So drug regulation and control, the third step. All right, in part one, we covered uh, some legislations covering pharmacy, the new drug approval process, and the patents regarding uh, when generics can be marketed. And then in part two, we discuss OTC, over-the-counter drugs. And we also discuss behind-the-counter drugs. And we introduce the control substance schedule in part two. So today's is going to be relatively short. We're going to go over DEA numbers, uh, DEA form 222 to order Schedule 2 drugs, and the drug recall process. So not too much uh, going on, so let's begin. DEA numbers. Um, the DEA will um, issue a DEA number for anybody prescribing controlled substances. Um, so it contains two letters and seven digits. And from time to time, you'll need to verify DEA numbers. Make sure they're valid before you process any controlled substances. Uh, the first letter, uh, we'll use the traditional designation for male medical doctors, male MDs. First letter would be A, female MDs. The first letter would be B. For mid-level practitioners, such as physician's assistant, nurse practitioners, family nurse practitioners, their first letter would be M. M for mid-level. Additionally, researchers such as those with PhDs or masters in science, MS, uh, they'll still need to order prescribe uh, controlled substances. Their first letter would be R. To determine the second letter of a DEA number, look at the prescriber's last name. The second letter of the DEA number will be the first letter of the prescriber's last name. For example, Dr. Tony J. Smith, MD, his first two letters would be AS, A for male doctor, S for Smith. For Dr. Sarah K. Miller, PhD, the first letter in the DEA number would be R. Notice the uh, degree. PhD. Even though the title is doctor, most likely the PhD would be a researcher. So the first letter would be R. The second letter would be M for Miller. You will then use a logarithm to verify the digits of a DEA number. A DEA number includes seven digits. However, you'll use the first six digits to verify the seventh. So in the first step, you'll take the number in the first, third, and fifth position and add those together. So in our example, the first, third, and fifth number would be one, three, and five respectively for a sum of nine. In the second step, you'll add the digit in the second, fourth, and sixth position. For our example, the numbers would be two, four, and six for a sum of 12. In step three, we're gonna multiply our sum from step two by two. So that would be 12 times two equals 24. We'll then add 24 to step one, which is nine. That gives us 33. And the number in the ones digit is our seventh. So for this example, the DEA number would be one, two, three, four, five, six, three. So let's try it uh, in the next example. So for this example, our prescriber is Dr. Brandy J. Anderson, MD. The first letter. Most likely female, female MDs, their first letter would be B. The second letter of a DE number would be the prescriber's last name, in this case, Anderson. So the first two letters would be B, A. Next, we'll verify the seventh digit using the first six. 
So after the logarithm, the DE number should come out to 3753921, one as the seventh digit. Which of the following is the correct DA number for Dr. Brian K. Rogers, MD? So the first letter of the DA number should be an A, Brian, male, MD, and the second letter should be R. So the two letters of the DA number should be AR, hence eliminating two of your choices, B and C. You will then have to verify the seventh digits for choices A and D. If you select D, you would have been correct. If you selected A, you would have also been correct. There was actually two correct answers among the choices. Additional DEA forms. So anytime you are dealing with controlled substances, you'll require specific license and registration. For example, if you're doing a drug treatment program, you'll need DEA form 363. And if you are retail pharmacy, you need to sell, distribute any narcotics, you'll need a retail form 224B. Public safety. So from time to time after a drug has been approved for use, there may be new adverse events uh, that come up. Uh, the study population is very limited, and once the drug is out into the entire public, uh, different patient groups are exposed to the drug, and new side effects might come about. So any adverse drug event or anything unexpected should be reported to the FDA via their MedWatch program. If you have an adverse event for vaccines, then there's a program for that as well, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting Program. And as you know, you can't sue a vaccine manufacturer for, for any harm. Drug recalls. Three classes of drug recalls. Class one, strong likelihood to cause serious adverse effect or death. Definitely we want to pull this drug off the market. An example would be any contaminated IV solution. Class two, the drug may cause a temporary but reverse adverse effect. Three, not likely to cause an adverse effect. Most likely a class three is a voluntary recall. Uh, it could be due to uh, an odor. The tablet has a odd odor. It does not affect the function or effectiveness of the drug, but it, it's unpleasant. So they'll voluntarily pull that off the market. The following uh, examples would fall under which recall class? Drug product has an unpleasant odor. We just went over that. That would be a class three. Microbial contamination of an IV product. Very serious. That is a class one. Faded label coloring. So many drugs are distinguished based on the color of the label, font size, etc. This case, it can lead to an error. They'll classify that as a class two. Mislabeled strength, definitely a class one. Uh, an example would be pediatric and adult strength heparin about a hundredfold different in strength and if you were to swap them adult strength for pediatric use could have severe effects can lead uh, to legal action lastly uh, chapter 3 uh, terminology uh, the terms are above recall negligence compliance injunction placebo protocol An inactive substance given in place of a medication. That would be placebo. Doing what is required. That is compliance. Failing to do something you should have done. Negligence. 
the action taken to remove a drug from the market that would be recall specific guidelines for practice those are protocols and lastly a court ordered preventing of action that would be an injunction this concludes All right, that brings us to the conclusion of the discussion on uh, drug control and regulation. So if you have any additional questions or anything wasn't clear, just let me know down in the comments and I'll get back to you. Uh, and if you're in class, just let me know then. Once again, Deng Teach at CCSD. I'd like to thank you for joining me and um, look in the playlist uh, for future videos. Thank you.